It is a record of man's technological achievements in mud, stone, and metal. Weaponry, the Tower of Babel, the Temple of Herod, the Ark of Noah. Faith or fact? Now, Bible Tech on Modern Marvels. It's the most influential book in history. It both unites and divides people through powerful lessons in faith and morality. But the Bible is equally appealing to a legion of archaeologists searching for the roots of civilization. The Bible is one of the best preserved ancient history texts that we have. It's an entire corpus of different letters, different books, different stories that have been brought down to us virtually unchanged over at least the last 2,000 years. The Bible is a handbook on how humans lived, worked, and made war. How they shaped raw materials into achievements that continue to serve humanity to this day. What we see described in the Bible is the world, uh, in one aspect, is a world of technology that existed uh, all the way back through the early Bronze and the, the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, the Iron Age, all the way down to the Roman period. These people were masters at controlling their environment as much as they possibly could. In the Bible's first book, Genesis, the dawn of technology appears in a legendary construction project. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The city was Babylon, hence its tower was called Babel, built to rival God and proclaim the greatness of men. As the story goes, God punished the people by confusing their language. Unable to communicate with one another, they formed tribes and scattered across the earth. But was the great tower of Babel real, or just the cornerstone of a parable? Could it have been a ziggurat? These are temples, and of course you build them high, I suppose, like the church spires. You want to get as close as possible to God himself. Uh, and that, because the landscape is so flat, it became a landmark as well. Perhaps the sands of modern-day Iraq hold clues to the Tower of Babel. Thousands of years ago, Iraq was known as Mesopotamia, a fertile plain split by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Beginning in the third millennium BC, the ancient land was home to the city of Babylon, history's first great metropolis. In the 1980s, a part of the city was reconstructed on orders from Saddam Hussein. But the original city ruins lay beneath. It was here that archaeologists found the base of a ziggurat dedicated to the god Marduk. It is believed by many to be the Bible's Tower of Babel. If intact, this ruin would probably match the size and scope of a famous partially reconstructed ziggurat. The Ur of the Chaldees in southern Iraq. Unlike the great Egyptian pyramids, ziggurats weren't made of stone. Stone was often a scarce commodity in the biblical lands, especially in the alluvial soil of Mesopotamia. But there was an unlimited supply of mud. In Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, Bricks made of mud were the building blocks of civilization. The process of brick making was a few ingredients, one of which was soil. It had to have around 10 to 15 percent clay and some straw and a mold. And the rest was done with back work. So we'll first start with digging a trench. Then we sprinkle a little bit of straw, adding some water. Next process is to mix mud. The sand acts as a filler. The clay acts as a, it gives it strength, and the straw is a binder. And this is called a stiff mud process, where the mud has to be pretty stiff, so that when you cast it in the mold, that it doesn't slump on you. So now I'm gonna slip the form off, Now I'm satisfied that that's a good quality brick. Of course, the brick has to sun dry, sun bake for about 25 days. The ancient ziggurats were monuments of sun baked mud. 
Typically, these temples were built in layers or steps, with newer, narrower steps added during the reign of each successive ruler. With as many as seven steps, the tallest ziggurats were projected to be over 300 feet high, containing more than 8 million mud bricks. But size doesn't always equal strength. You have to think about the fact that mud brick is fundamentally dried mud. So if it rains on it again or gets wet again, it's going to be mud again. To fight the elements, the Mesopotamian builders practiced weatherproofing. A portion of the mud bricks was fire-baked in kilns. The top layer of each cigarette step was covered with kiln-fired bricks that supported worshippers and also protected the layers of inferior sun-baked bricks from the rain. Going a step further, they added guttering. Channels were cut in the brick surfaces to capture rainwater, draining it down and away from the ziggurat. Despite these efforts, sheer weight created another engineering problem. So typically, ziggurats are built on silt. You have to worry about uh, differential settlements. You have to worry about, um, during the flooding season, that ground, if you want to, become like quicksand. The silt will simply slide from under the building um, trying to escape the pressure, basically. To overcome the soft earth, builders placed a layer of twisted, crisscrossed reeds every sixth layer of mud brick. And the idea there is this would be like reinforcement if you want to force when the ground gets wet and the foundation get weakened that the structure won't lean in one direction and fall down. Despite a vulnerability to rain, Mud brick was an indispensable building material in biblical times. Today, it's valued in areas like the American Southwest. It's cheap, plentiful, and above all, energy efficient. Adobe houses are traditionally known to be very warm in the wintertime and very cool in the summertime. In the summertime, if your walls are thick enough, the heat will not penetrate so your house will stay cooler. At night, you sleep with your windows and doors open and the adobes absorb the cool of the night and store it as energy and release it during the day. In the winter time, if you bring a bit of heating inside, even body heat will keep the heat in, so they're extremely comfortable buildings to, to live in. In modern adobe buildings, the outer walls are plastered to weatherproof against moisture. In biblical cities, homeowners applied a fresh layer of mud masonry to the exterior every season. Mud brick improvements jumped dramatically during the reign of Babylon's greatest ruler, King Hammurabi, in the 18th century BC. The 229th rule of the Code of Hammurabi did not mince words. If a builder build a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built fall in and kill its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. So the, those builders were, were under tremendous amount of pressure to build strong, uh, strong walls. And so they've developed rule of thumb on the height versus the thickness of the wall. So the higher the wall needed to go, the thicker need it needed to be. The thicker walls also gave birth to a very innovative construction technology, arches and vaulted ceilings. While the Romans are often credited with arch development, mud brick arches in ancient Mesopotamia, Israel, and Egypt are documented thousands of years before the Roman period. Because heat rises, leaving cooler air at ground level, the higher arched ceilings offered further cooling benefits while adding more living space. What is beautiful about the arches is the fact that the whole now wall can be built out of a brick and no timber would be needed because the distribution of load on the arch, basically the load comes down and gets distributed over the arch, all in compression and all the way down to the foundation. You know, what I like to remind people is that they really had the same brains we do. And they thought about this stuff a lot. And for them, it was a matter of life and death. The compulsion to build bigger and more impressive temples is a constant theme in biblical civilizations. But with a surface bigger than 30 football fields, King Herod's Temple Mount complex would prove to be the greatest of them all. In Israel, the city of Jerusalem lives and works in the 21st century. But a casual glance at the ancient stone streets and crumbling ruins reveals another time. According to the Bible, 
Its origins are in the time of Abraham, somewhere in the second millennium BC. In the southern part of the city, a massive structure sits on the summit of Mount Moriah. It's called the Temple Mount, a gigantic platform that was once the foundation of King Herod's temple. Its advanced stonework surpassed any structure mentioned in the Bible. And for thousands of years, it has been the center of the Jewish faith. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? We read in the New Testament, and when Jesus was uh, speaking, they said, well, they've been building for 46 years, and it still was not finished. And we know that up to, you know now from the excavations, that it was never actually completely finished. The Temple Mount is also a holy place for the followers of Islam, who call it Haram es Sharif, or Noble Sanctuary. The Prophet Muhammad is said to have ascended into heaven from a rock atop the mount in 632 AD. His Muslim followers built a mosque called the Dome of the Rock, above the presumed holy site. Today, Muslims control the Temple Mount. So you get two different nations, as it were, two peoples that lay claim to the same spot, which is for the Jews, of course, the most holiest spot there ever was. According to the Bible, the first incarnation of the Temple was built under King David's son, Solomon, in 967 BC. The temple stood on Mount Moriah for 381 years until it was burnt to ashes by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Herod the Great was king of the Jews from 37 to 4 BC. The Bible describes Herod as a cold, oppressive ruler, hated by his subjects. So Herod set out to win the love of his people. He would rebuild Solomon's temple on a scale never before imagined. In 21st century Jerusalem, piecing together the puzzle of Herod's temple is a political nightmare. For years, the mount was under Jordanian control, and archaeological excavation was strictly forbidden. After the Six-Day War in 1967, archaeologists were finally granted access to areas adjacent to the Temple Mount. Over a 10-year excavation period, the mystery of its construction began to reveal itself in the massive stones. In some areas, they found stones that are as much as 42 feet long, 11 feet thick, 14 feet high, that weigh 600 tons. And those stones are at the bottom, at the base of these retaining walls. The Temple Mount was built to level the top of Mount Moriah and provide a huge podium for the temple complex. The mount itself is a rectangle measuring 1,600 feet by 900 feet, an area the size of 30 football fields. In excavations beneath the sacred western wall, archaeologists found that the wall originally equaled the height of a nine-story building. When you come to it, you're absolutely surprised, first of all, by the sheer size of the temple and the temple mount, which is absolutely colossal. It was one of the largest buildings in the world. The largest pyramid in, in Egypt, the Giza one, will fit two and a half times on the temple mount. The plans for the temple mount relied on state-of-the-art technologies circa 1st century BC. Drawing on the geometry and mathematics of the Greeks and the stonesmithing and engineering of the Romans, Herod brought together a construction team unrivaled in history. He had master builders, architects, engineers from, from Greece, from Rome, from his own people there. He sent emissaries to Egypt to study the way they did things there, how they moved stones. So he had lots of labor, he had lots of technical support. And he had material. He had a whole mountain of limestone. Herod's building material came from his own backyard. Moriah was a mountain of limestone. By locating the quarries adjacent to the construction site, the logistics were ideal. But the massive building blocks had to be extracted from solid bedrock. Herod's quarry masters took advantage of the limestone's horizontal layering to make blocks. Much like a birthday cake, the layers in the rock create natural separation seams. 
you mark out the size of stone you want, and then with pickaxes, they dig channels all around, on three sides, round the size of the stone you're going to cut out, going down about four feet the height of that bedrock layer. In two of those channels, at right angles, they hammered in dry wooden beams, then poured water over the dry wood, which then expands, and wood can expand with such a force that the stone was actually forced out of its bedrock place, and then the stone is free. As a precaution, Herod had the craftsmen shape and finish the blocks before they left the quarry. By preparing the stones in advance, before he leveled the first holy temple site, Herod assured his people that the new temple was no hoax. The real proof was the thousands of finely shaped and decorated stone blocks. And then as you get a block out, then they would finish the blocks by grinding them with harder stones or chiseling them with harder stones. Once extracted and shaped, the heavy blocks had to be moved. Smaller stones were loaded onto wagons, but oxen pulled the heaviest blocks over wooden lubricated rails. The workers had a natural advantage, gravity. The quarries were located uphill from the Temple Mount site. So those stones didn't have to be lifted up into place, they were actually lowered down into place. And then once they are in place, they were lifted off by a, a short tripod crane, very strong ones, and then exactly lowered into their place. Applying the laws of physics, Herod's men used leverage to assemble the mount. Using multiple pulley wheels, they could magnify their applied force and lift the huge stones into place. Before the stones were placed, the bedrock had to be leveled, a process that took years of digging and scraping. Once the base layer was leveled, the perfectly square stones were set one on top of the other. With no mortar or joints to join them, their sheer weight held the walls in place. Archaeologists have discovered a pre-planned system for assembling the massive walls. And so the stones were actually numbered, some of them, in the quarries, the most important ones, so that the builders would know exactly where to place those stones. We found columns that were built of sections, and each section was numbered as well. By the time Jesus entered the temple in 31 AD, Herod's legacy was nearly complete. The Bible describes Christ's frequent visits to teach. In one sermon, he would foretell a dark day for the temple. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. The scriptures proved accurate. In 70 AD, at the end of a four-year battle to end a Jewish revolt, Roman general Titus took Jerusalem. His men set fire to the temple's wooden roof and later obliterated the temple complex stone by stone with battering rams. Now, like Jesus said, not one stone shall be left upon another, but he was referring to the buildings that were built on top of this platform. But the retaining walls are still standing up today on the southeastern corner, almost up to the top, because those stones were so heavy, even the Romans couldn't dislodge them. Nearly two millennia after the destruction, Muslims control the Temple Mount. A ban on further excavation leaves the world an incomplete picture of Herod's engineers. They were very sophisticated people. They knew about statistics and weight and pressures, and they knew how thick the walls had to be to retain the pressure from the outside. And it's even withstood earthquakes, because those Herodian stones are still standing there today after 2,000 years without a crack in them. So they knew what they were doing. The Temple Mount construction demonstrated the importance of engineers and stone craftsmen. But in the face of almost constant war, the metalsmith became the most important technician in biblical history. The tank brings three tactical advantages to the battlefield. Armor, speed, and firepower. These machines are modern, but their forerunners can be found in the pages of the Old Testament. A chariot is an overwhelming instrument of, uh, of warfare. If you have uh, a whole platoon or a whole group of chariots coming at you at one time, you can imagine the overwhelming terror that it might uh, inspire in the infantry. The workmanship of the wheels was like the workmanship of a chariot wheel. Their axle pins, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all of cast bronze. Chariots were basically mobile firing platforms. Early models were built light for speed and ease of disassembly. 
The heavier chariots favored by the Romans traded speed for stability, protecting them and offering a more reliable firing platform. The earliest biblical references place the chariot in ancient Egypt. The Egyptians were masters of chariot technology. This was evident when Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered in 1922. The tomb's anteroom contained four disassembled chariots in near perfect condition. These 14th century BC vehicles confirmed an advanced knowledge of wheel design. One of the things the Egyptians recognized is that the number of spokes on a wheel made a difference. Where an Egyptian wagon might have four spokes, a chariot, because of its speed and because of the weight that it carried, might have, uh, and usually did have, six spokes. They were pulled typically by uh, two horses, and they were built only for one thing, for speed. They were not fortified, they were not armored, their speed was their weapon. The light wheels were strengthened by iron rims. A leather strap held the wheel in place over the axle. This leather thong made it easy to uh, remove and replace a wheel in order to make it easy on, easy off, much like you see a NASCAR uh, pit team do today. The chariots in Tut's tomb reveal the first sleeve bearings. The inside of the bearings were coated with animal fat to reduce the friction between wheel and axle. For added speed and cornering ability, the Egyptians lengthened the axle and moved the carriage of the chariot back and over it to better distribute the weight. By comparison, the later Assyrian and Roman chariots were simply heavier, stronger translations of Egyptian technologies. While chariots and other biblical weapons evolved over generations, some never changed. One such weapon was simple, but it was undeniably deadly in the hands of the future King David as he dueled with the giant Goliath. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. We wonder how in the world could he slay a giant with, you know, something like that. And yet when you look at a sling stone, what you have really is a piece of flint that's been chipped down to about the size of a baseball. So it's aerodynamically sound. And slinging it around the head in a sling, it can reach speeds of, say, 80, 95 miles an hour, about like a baseball pitcher uh, throwing his best fastball. So uh, you can imagine something like that coming at you, perhaps in great quantities. Slings were highly accurate, as the Bible refers to Benjamin's crack left-handed slinger troops. Every one could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. The technology of metal was of paramount interest to the warriors of the Bible. Sharper, harder weapons that didn't break meant victory on the battlefield. Smaller metallic weapons like spear points were the favored technology as far back as the Bronze Age in the early second millennium. The earliest uh, spear points cast in bronze were probably done from the archaeological record in stone molds. Limestone is very easy to carve. It's very plentiful throughout the, the biblical land by taking two pieces and scrubbing them together with a small layer of sand between it. You can get a mated surface between the two pieces of limestone and by carving a depression into the limestone, two pieces held together, they could make a void out of that stone which was then filled with the molten bronze and ultimately were able to mass produce significant quantities of weaponry like this. You think about arming one of King David's or King Saul's armies, they had to produce thousands of spear points. Metal technology made a big difference in the length of the swords that were available to uh, soldiers. As warfare technology evolved, swords became the weapon of choice. A typical bronze sword was not longer than maybe 25 to 35 centimeters. And the only way to produce that shape was by casting, because that's the nature of the bronze. It's very difficult to forge, but very easy to cast. It melts at a fairly low temperature. Because cast bronze was more brittle, longer sword blades could easily break in battle. Around 1200 BC, men began extracting and shaping iron. This was the beginning of the Iron Age, a time when biblical armies began fighting with stronger, sharper weapons, including the longsword. 
It was also a time when blacksmiths unwittingly pioneered the concept of lamination with layers of iron. The early biblical blacksmiths lacked the technology to heat a furnace above 1600 degrees. The temperature needed to melt iron. They were limited to working with inferior porous chunks of sponge-like iron called blooms. So in order to get solid materials, they had to be hammered and be turned into very thin sheets. And those sheets later on had to be stacked together and re-hot hammer welded into larger uh, sections. And as a result of it, those thin layers got bonded to each other and created a structure that was very strong, very fracture resistant, and also very uh, rigid. Layered iron is stronger than one thick layer iron for the same reason that plywood is stronger and more rigid than wood plank. It's very interesting to note that today in the aerospace industry we are using very same concept to make what is known as the composite materials. Iron Age weapons gradually became stronger and more deadly. It took later development as they proceeded and in, in advanced into the Iron Age where they learned to infuse carbon into the iron and actually produce steel that they were able to make a weapon that was superior to many of the late Bronze Age period weaponry. When Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem in 586 BC, he understood the military importance of a blacksmith. And all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen, and smiths a thousand. Even them, the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And in so doing, he effectively disarmed the, the nation of Israel. Without the blacksmith, they had no ability to either produce or maintain any existing weapons. But metal weapons often made little difference during a siege. Against the overwhelming brutality of the Assyrian army, city defenders put all their faith in wall-building technology. The word war appears more than 300 times in the Bible. Sword appears 380 times. There is little doubt that warfare was a constant reality for people of the Bible. For them, it was the fault of geography. The cities of Israel and Judah were centered along the important trade routes of their unfriendly neighbors. They were surrounded by big and very mighty empires, the Mesopotamian empires on one end, on the east, the Aramean empires on the north, and the Egyptian empire on the south. And in order to stay independent, they had to be able to fend off the armies of those empires. So by doing so, they had to develop and erect very, very robust and very strong fortifications. For the small city-states, all resources were invested in the technology of wall building. Strong outer walls meant survival. Some of these walls could easily be up to 15 meters high and the idea was to uh, make it high enough that scaling would be difficult but also that missiles which are being hurled from the top of the wall will accumulate kinetic energy and will do more devastation on the enemy according to one bible account breaching a fortified city wall was merely a matter of enlisting god's help the lord said to joshua it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. The miraculous destruction of the walls of Jericho was not a scenario that conquering armies counted on. For them, the battering ram was the highest form of siege technology. The ram was a long beam with a sharp metal head that was forcibly thrust into the wall. Once it penetrated the wall, it was moved from side to side to dislodge the stones. As the ram first came into use in the second millennium BC, wall technology evolved. Defenders built hollow chambers in the wall called casements. The battering ram was a piece of equipment that would uh, smash or demolish the wall. And by making chambers in the wall, it was possible to fill those chambers 
with a gravel and with sand and by doing so to absorb the impact of the battering ram. As bigger, more powerful rams were developed in the first century BC, the casement walls were abandoned in favor of thicker, heavier walls. A second anti-battering ram technology became a standard feature. Reviving an ancient technique, city defenders in the 9th century BC built massive artificial sloping ramparts called glacis. Built with earth and stone, the glacis made it nearly impossible to position battering rams within striking distance of the wall. They also made it nearly impossible to tunnel under the walls. Nowhere is the documentation clearer than that of the siege of Lachish in 701 BC. Lachish was a Judean city south of Jerusalem that was attacked and conquered by Assyrian king Sennacherib. In 1849, archaeologists excavating the king's palace found a room that chronicled the history of the siege at Lachish. A series of stone reliefs are an amazing diary of a bloody siege. There you see the story of the Assyrian army attacking this large city in Judah, well fortified, up on its hill, strong walls, and the Assyrians build a siege ramp, the remains of which can still be seen today, and up this siege ramp they move their machinery, their rams, their soldiers, their archers, their slingers, all of them attacking the city. The Assyrians represented the most advanced military in the region prior to the Romans. They were a professional siege force, and their weaponry was state-of-the-art. The Assyrian siege machines resembled very much the modern tank. They were actually rolling on very large wheels. The machine had very large boom or uh, beam with a metal uh, tip and it also had a turret which had a very interesting function. It had people standing there with buckets of water and as the people on the walls were throwing burning uh, oil or burning uh, torches on the boom of the ram trying to set it on fire, the people on the turret would pour water on that fire to extinguish it. While fortifications improved the survival odds of any city, one civil service was equally important, water. Most uh, water sources for cities are outside of the cities. If your city is under attack or under siege, is how do you get to your water? If you can't get your, to your water, then you need to surrender. If they were anticipating a siege, they would dig to the bedrock in the direction of the uh, source of water uh, from inside the city, they would tunnel into the spring, have an access to the water from inside the city, and then when the enemy get near the city, they would block off the water source on the surface to prevent the enemy from having an access to the supply of water. But occasionally, these covert water tunnels were turned against the city defenders. We have a great example of that in the book of Second Kings with David capturing Jerusalem. The Jerusalem water source is outside of the city walls called the Gihon Spring. And uh, the Jebusites, or the people of Jerusalem, were taunting David that you couldn't capture that city. And he commanded Joab to go up through the water shaft and to capture the city of Jerusalem. Two centuries later, Jerusalem's King Hezekiah upgraded the water system to better protect against the Assyrian army that would lay siege to Jerusalem in 705 BC. Hezekiah's tunnel zigzagged more than 580 yards into the city of David and remains today as an engineering wonder of the Bible. Water in the Holy Land was a precious commodity that cities defended to the death. It gave life, but in one biblical epic, it destroyed life not before one man of God sequestered two of every animal on his famous ark. They're the largest cargo carriers on earth. Fully loaded ocean-going vessels can weigh more than 500,000 tons. Their outstanding carrying capacity was recognized by the Bible's book of Genesis. 
the story of Noah's Ark celebrates one of history's greatest ships. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Noah was instructed to build a massive wooden ship and collect a pair of every animal species on earth. When God unleashed the biblical flood that covered the earth, the ark and its inhabitants survived and repopulated the world. But is it just a captivating morality tale? In recent decades, underwater archaeology conducted in the Black Sea has tried to give support to the flood story. In the 1998 book, Noah's Flood, scientists William Ryan and Walter Pittman theorized that some 7,000 years ago, melting glaciers caused a massive influx of salt water from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea, then a freshwater lake. Core samples from the shoreline gave evidence for a sudden shift from freshwater to saltwater animal life. But this is only one of several flood scenarios. I'm not convinced that the flooding of the Black Sea was the event that's recorded in the Bible as being Noah's flood. One of the things that we know as anthropologists is that most cultures in the world actually do have a flood myth where the world is destroyed by water, where the world is covered in water. From Noah's Ark and the even older Babylonian epic flood of Gilgamesh, to the Greek, Roman, and Irish legends, the flood belief is long on popularity, but short on proof. The same holds true for the Ark. Despite numerous unfounded Ark sightings over the years, understanding how the legendary vessel may have been constructed can only come from known ancient shipbuilding techniques. So how would this boat have been built? Ancient boat technology is different than the way we build boats today. Today we build boats in a way that's called frame first or skeleton first. We lay down the keel and then we put up the frames or the ribs of the boat and it looks kind of like a skeleton. And then we put the planks on the outside. We build from the inside out. But in the ancient world, just about everywhere, every culture that we examine the remains of early boats, they built from the outside in. They built the shell of the boat or the hull first. Boats must resist leakage, so biblical builders developed a sophisticated technology for tightly joining the wood planks. One of the most reliable methods was the mortise and tenon. When we look at a mortise and tenon fasting, we're talking about a tenon, which is a free piece of wood and slots that are cut in the edge of a plank. In this case, this is just a simple model for demonstration. And the mortise just fits in here halfway, and then you put it in one that's on the opposite side. And then you fit the upper plank onto it and you have to hit it really hard in the, in the real case um, to get it to fit and then you have this nice smooth plank seam that, that you can subsequently um, put pegs through to hold the tenon in place. And this is the way people built boats for at least 4,000 years. We have evidence of that in the Mediterranean and in the Nile area because this is the area where the Bible is set where its, it's um, geography is, it's very likely that Noah's Ark would have had the same kind of technology. To support the weight of its huge passenger list, the Ark would have to have been a vessel of massive proportions. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the Ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A cubit is a biblical unit of measure determined by the distance from the tip of the middle finger to the elbow. By assigning a length of 25 inches for one cubit, Noah's Ark would measure 624 feet long by 104 feet wide by 62 feet high. A huge vessel, but not without historical precedent. There are some historical references to ships that are described as being 500 feet long. Um, one of the things that we know the Egyptians did was to transport obelisks on wooden boats. And the pharaoh Hatshepsut, who was a queen, described about 3,500 years ago the boat that she had built. And the boat that she built to carry two obelisks is one that would carry a 747 loaded with 40 elephants. These are our first super freighters that we hear about from other sources than the Bible. One man decided to take God's coordinates at face value. 
Joseph K. Silver was a Pennsylvania engineer by trade and an ARC devotee in his spare time. For nearly 30 years, he worked on a feasibility study of the ARC, drawing on everything from marine architecture and physics to chemistry and zoology. But Silver died in 1995, and it appeared so did his ARC manuscript. Shortly after his death, family and friends began piecing together his notes, and in 2000, submitted them for review to Ed Shearer of Shearer & Associates, a nautical engineering firm. I decided to take it up and figure I could spend five minutes on it, shoot a bunch of holes in it, and send it back to the gentleman. After several hours later, I was very involved in it, looking up requirements and standards in the, from the United States Coast Guard, from the American Bureau of Shipping, from the International Maritime Organization, these type organizations to try to refute what Mr. Silver had come up with. And basically, the, his concept of the ARC fit all of the requirements. Silver's ARC would have been among the largest vessels ever built. A rule of thumb is that ocean-going barges have basically a length to depth ratio of about 15 to 1 or less. The ark actually met that criteria of being about 40 feet deep to the, as we call it, the strength deck on the ark, with the 627 feet long. Shearer created a model of the ark with simple yet highly accurate software, used extensively by the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard for engineering analysis. We determined that the ark had basically adequate stability to encounter waves of various heights in accordance with Coast Guard criteria. There was really no uh, excess bending moments in the arc. It would float fairly level. It would float without a lot of stress in the hull, so we figured that the structure of the arc was adequate. Was it divine inspiration or just wishful thinking? Continuing efforts to locate ancient shipwrecks deep in the Black Sea may someday answer more questions about the biblical arc. So there was a possibility in people's heads that they could build boats this large. It's only been about 45 years since the first scientific underwater excavation took place. And so we're still stretching our wings. There are expeditions all over the world, though, that are looking in deeper waters, looking deeper under sediments for ancient ships, and trying to really unlock the keys to the ideas people had in their minds about ancient uh, technology. As marine science and archaeological excavation takes us to even greater depths, the good book will continue to provide the historical context. And so archaeology goes hand in hand with the biblical text to show us how life in those days uh, was overcome and the necessity of life was met through uh, the people of the Bible. As we unearth more evidence of ancient capabilities, Archaeologists will continue to search for important clues in the pages of the Bible. One of the greatest records of human technological achievement in history.